Welcome back. In this week's topic, we looked at uh, assets or specific assets, in this case, receivables, inventory, and non-current assets. Now, the reason we chose to focus on these particular assets um, can be explained or you know illustrated by looking at the balance sheet of Woolworths. Um, so if we have a look at um, the current assets and non-current assets that we see here, and I've just highlighted uh, the areas or, the, or the, you know, the types of accounts that we'll be looking at, we see they are quite substantial in nature um, as you know, compared to the, the total assets which are sitting on the balance sheet. So if we look at receivables, um, they amount to about three quarters of a billion dollars. Uh, inventories of Woolworths are about $4 billion and property plant and equipment is about eight and a half billion dollars. Um, so when you add up all those together, you're looking at, what's that, 12, 12 and a half, 13, a touch over 13 uh, billion dollars out of roughly 23. Now obviously there's a, you know, there's a few other assets which you know, comprise a fair bit. Cash, they've got about a billion dollars in cash um, and cash equivalents, um, half a billion dollars in financial assets, um, over a billion dollars in assets held for sale, and six and a half billion dollars of intangible assets. Now, just for the interest of time, we can't obviously cover all of these things. Um, but what's important is that the areas that we do cover will give you a good flavor of how to account for assets in general and, and some of the areas where you know you might want to think about how um, you know some of the the difficulties in accounting for assets and asset values. So in terms of the learning objectives for this particular topic, we can pretty much break them down into the two, the first two in relation to receivables, how to account for them and how to report them, and then also how to deal with uh, those receivables which you're not going to collect. Uh, if we move into the next two, uh, next two objectives, we look at inventory, how it's recorded, expensed, and reported, um, and also then look at how we can identify or how we can measure cost of goods sold using different inventory costing methods and also why we need to do that. Lastly, we'll turn to property, plant and equipment. We'll look at how property, plant and equipment is recorded, expensed and reported. Uh, we'll then look at how to depreciate property, plant and equipment and also why we depreciate property, plant and equipment. And finally, we'll look at how to get rid of property, plant and equipment. So turning first to receivables. So receivables represent a business's claim on the assets of another entity. Now, most commonly we see them as accounts receivable, and this is when an amount is owed by a customer who has purchased a good or service on credit. Sometimes you'll see them called trade receivables, and we actually saw that in Woolworths uh, financial statements just before that they had trade and other receivables sitting there. Now, how we record them initially, we've already seen. Um, so this is not a this is not all that novel for us here. Uh, so in this case, we have Tom's Toys, and they're producing fidget spinners. Um, I think these things don't really exist so much. I mean, certainly the craze seems to have passed, thankfully. Um, and they sell them not straight to consumers, but they sell them to retailers who will then on sell them to consumers. Uh, so on the fourth of June. Tom sells $10,000 worth of product on account. Now I should, you know, it's semantic, but it's important. I should, should mention when we're talking about, in this case, the $10,000 worth of product, we're talking about, you know, in this instance, how much the sticker price was, how much, you know, they were actually going to receive for them, not the actual value of the inventory itself. Um, so in this case, they debit accounts receivable, which is the asset 10,000 and the credit sales revenue uh, to reflect that they have sold the good. The problem is not every single one of his customers is likely to pay him. Um, it is rare. I mean, it is possible, but it is rare that 100% of customers will end up uh, paying off their debts. And this may not be because they're bad customers. This could be because they run into their own problems. Um, something else has gone on at their end. So, you know, it does happen. So the critical thing is less than 100% of um, those accounts are likely to be collected. And accrual accounting requires, requires what is called the allowance method. And what this means is that, 
there is an adjustment made at the end of the period. And so what we see with this adjustment is an increase in the expense, so debit bad debts expense, and a credit for the allowance for bad debts. Now the reason why this adjustment happens, what the reason why this adjustment happens and so you see that expense getting tied to or getting matched to uh, the revenue um, from the sale that took place. So we're trying to match off the debt going bad in the same period as the sale happening. Um, so that's important. So we're trying to get that match between the revenues and expenses for that particular sale, even if the debt only goes bad, you know, the next period or potentially much later than that. Uh, we're trying to match off that revenue and that expense. Um, so we'll actually look at the second block of this first. Is it, and that's what I was talking about here, is the revenue from the sales made is matched with the expense of the expected bad debts. Um, but probably more importantly is the second little section there, which is that the net accounts receivable are then reported at their net realizable value. And that's really important because if an external user is looking at Tom's financial statements and they see accounts receivable of $10,000 listed as an asset, the logical assumption would be that Tom expects to collect $10,000. But it's going to be pretty unlikely that Tom expects that to happen. Uh, it'll be somewhere less than $10,000. It may be a very little bit less or maybe quite a lot less, but it's not likely to be $10,000. So what should really be shown is the net realizable value of those accounts receivable. And the net realizable value is the amount that the business actually expects to get um, from that particular asset. And it doesn't just have to refer to accounts receivable like it does in this case, but net realizable value could be the amount of cash or the net amount of cash that a business expects to get from any type of asset. Uh, and so there will be times when you need to look at these things. So that's important so that when a user looks at Tom's financial statements, they get a much better sense of actually how much cash is likely to be realized. It comes through not as a reduction, um, so not as a credit to accounts receivable, but as a credit to the allowance account, allowance for bad debts. This is a contra asset account and it nets off against accounts receivable. It's got a, it's got a credit normal balance um, and it will ultimately reduce the amount of assets sitting um, in the balance sheet. The problem is, or one of the problems is, is that we have this entry debit bad debts expense, credit allowance for bad debts, but we don't know how much. And there are two common methods that we use, um, and there are obviously more methods out there, but um, and they can get quite a lot more complicated. But the two basic methods are the percentage of using the percentage of sales or using the percentage of accounts receivable. Um, whatever method is used, the calculation is based on the entity's prior experience. So for the percentage of sales method, what we're calculating here, and this is important, what we're calculating here is the bad debts expense. And we get that simply by taking the credit sales made by the company and multiplying it by whatever percentage that the company considers to be reasonable in this case. In this particular case, we've got 4%. The 10,000 sales at 4% gives you $400. So you debit bad debts expense 400, credit allowance for bad debts 400. Now, what's important here is the 10,000 is an objective number. There will be detailed inf information about that. The 4% is an estimate. That is, you know, it obviously would is likely to be verified against you know prior experience and historical information uh, the auditors will have a look at this number um, but it is ultimately an estimate and hopefully a good one by the company the percentage of accounts receivable is slightly different um, or this method in that we're not calculating the bad debts expense anymore what we're calculating is the closing allowance for bad debts um, and to get this we take the closing gross accounts receivable balance by the estimate and we multiply it by the estimated percentage. So in this case, Tom's toys, Tom has collected $1,000 from the 10,000 sales, which means 
they still to collect 9,000. And of that 9,000, they expect 3% to be uncollectible. In addition, the opening balance of the allowance account is zero. The closing balance, as we mentioned before, of the account receivable is $9,000, the 10,000 minus the 1,000, and you multiply that by the 3%, gives you $270. Now, the $270, as mentioned, is not the expense. Well, in this case it is, but that's coincidence. The $270 we've just calculated is the, is the ending balance. To get the adjustment, you have to take the difference between the ending balance or the closing balance and the opening balance, which in this case happens to be $270. So we debit bad debts expense $270, credit allowance for bad debts $270. There will come a time when a company realizes that they're just not going to get their money back. Um, companies have this happen. Individuals have this happen. I'm sure you can think of someone that you've lent money to sometime in the past where a point in time comes when you're just going to stop asking. Or maybe even you never really asked in the first place. You were just hoping that they would pay you back. And it becomes obvious that that's just not going to happen. At this point is when the debt gets written off. And in this particular example, with Tom's Toys, they write off $50. We debit allowance for bad debts $50, thus reducing the, the contra account. And we credit accounts receivable $50, thus reducing the accounts receivable account. But if we look at those entries, one is reducing the asset, the other is reducing the contra asset. There is no profit and loss effect on it, nor is there any net effect on the balance sheet. Actually, if you look at it, there is no net effect on net accounts receivable. All that it does is basically strip it out of the allowance and remove it from accounts receivable. Turning now to our second set of assets that we need to have a look at, let's look at inventory. So what inventory is, is a tangible asset that is held for resale in the normal course of operations. Um, so there are things that can get sold, lots of things. Pretty much any asset can be sold, but the idea about inventory is that the intention is that these particular items are being bought to be resold. That's the idea. Um, so you can have you know, office equipment, sort of pens, stationery, all those sort of things, which for... You know, most normal companies, say, or even universities, these things would be supplies because they're going to be used up in the course of business. But for a company like Officeworks or Staples, um, who buy these things to sell them, they are inventory. Um, so the way we account for them is, you know, using the cost principle, inventory is recorded at its acquisition cost. This this idea of acquisition cost includes all costs incurred to get the inventory delivered or prepared for sale, or in this case, you know, prepared for resale. Um, this idea of inventory being acquired at cost is actually similar to pretty much how most assets are, be, are recorded, is that the asset, any asset, or for the you know, majority of assets are recorded at acquisition costs, which includes everything required to get them to where they're going to be used, and in the, and in the condition that they need to, and, and in the condition that they need to be used. So debit inventory, credit cash, or accounts payable. So as an example, we have Devon Gifts purchases purchases twenty thousand dollars of inventory. So that's the actual that is the actual um, cost they'll pay to the supplier for the inventory itself, and they do this on credit, uh, and they do this on October the tenth. Uh, the cost of shipping is $300, and which is paid to a third party. Uh, turns out that some of the inventory is damaged, and the supplier will give a $1,000 discount for that. And five days later, they pay off the invoice, and they do this early, and they receive a 1% discount on the remaining $19,000 owed. So if we look at the entries for these, um, in the first instance, debit inventory credit accounts payable. That's pretty straightforward. It's a $20,000. We include as a debit to inventory the $300 shipping. We don't expense it out because those 
particular shirts or those particular gifts are not useful to Devon unless they actually have them. So the inventory, the shipping costs is included. The inventory, the accounts payable is reduced by a thousand because there's been a discount given and the inventory is reduced by a thousand. And finally, when the debt is paid off or the account payable is paid off, that account payable has to end up at zero. So the net, the balance at this point was 19,000. So to get rid of it, we debit 19,000. We are, well, not we, Devon only paid 18,810, which is 99% of the 19,000. So that's the amount of cash which has gone out of the business. The remaining credit of 190 is a credit to inventory uh, because the actual cost of inventory is being reduced because of this early payment. And so when you add up the debit inventory, debit inventory, credit inventory, credit inventory, you end up with inventory valued at, on the books at $19,110. When it's sold, inventory the inventory account needs to be reduced and an expense for cost of goods sold recognized. Um, now, there are two different types of inventory systems that can be used. There's the perpetual system and the periodic system. Um, we, in this particular instance, will only focus on the perpetual system. And so this records things as they happen, rather in the periodic system, rather than in the periodic system where it only takes place at the end of the period. So on November the 2nd, they sell $400 worth of inventory for $600, which is the entire point of buying and then reselling. So you buy it and then you sell it for more than what you bought it for. Debit cash, 600. Credit sales revenue, 600. Debit cost of goods sold, 400. Credit inventory, 400. But we have a problem, or at least a conundrum, which is how did Devon Gifts know cost of goods sold was $400? And the reason why this is a problem, or the reason why this problem exists, is that not every single item of inventory purchased throughout the course of an accounting period will have been purchased for exactly the same unit price. The actual unit price of the item itself may have changed over the over the period. Um, the cost of shipping, or you know, the various other costs which could get built into the cost of inventory, may have also changed. Um, the key of that is that not it is highly unlikely, if not in, you know, completely improbable, that inventory will have exactly the same per unit price. So that's the first bit. The second bit is. It is also highly unlikely, if not impossible, for a company or an organization to know exactly which item of inventory was sold. It is possible in some cases, but for the most part, it's not. So if we have a look at this fridge here of an, un an, of an unnamed supermarket, we don't know and this, you know, the supermarket won't know exactly how much each of those items cost. So when you pick one of those up and, and take it to the, to the register and scan it out, um, they obviously know what item you've taken, but they won't know how much that specific item costs them to purchase. And it's because of this we have a number of models for how we assume inventory is purchased and sold. There are four, although the first one isn't actually a model. The first one is actually basically how everything could be done if we knew. So for specific identification, when a company actually knows how much that specific item costs, they can use this method. Um, so things like cars, um, bespoke or custom jewelry or high-end jewelry, they're likely to know exactly how much that particular item costs them. But those are the exception. More likely, a, an entity will have a pretty good idea of how inventory generally flows, but it won't be perfect to the, to the specific item. So first in, first out works really well with perishable type goods. Uh, so in this method, the cost of inventories purchased 
first are the ones that are soon to be sold first. And these are the, and these are the inventories that go into cost of goods sold first. The goods which are purchased at the end are the ones which are left on the shelf and assumed to be ending inventory. So if we go back to the previous slide, the milk, let's assume that this photo was taken on the 30th of June 2017 um, in Woolworths. If we're using FIFO, this makes sense because for this milk, that would mean that it was purchased round about the 29th or 30th of June because it's that would be one of the last purchases in that financial year and that's the one which those are the those are the items which are left on the shelf because realistically I'd be quite surprised if there was any milk I mean I'd be very very surprised if there was any milk left on the shelf of Woolworths from a week ago two weeks ago six months ago 12 months ago um, so generally speaking perishable goods as they get bought in they're the first ones sold Last in, first out is a complete opposite of that. And truth be told, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because it's basically saying that the items of inventory which are on the shelf at the end of the year were the first ones purchased. Now this method is not permitted in Australia. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. The last method which fits well with non-perishable goods is you basically average out inventory as it comes in. So we're using a moving average. So as new inventory gets added, it's almost like everything gets pulled and then we just get the average price per, per unit and we see that getting applied. So we're gonna have a look at some numbers in relation to this, which will help make more sense, make this make more sense. So we have Wombat General Store and they sell a specialty Goanna oil that it purchased from Dingo Manufacturing. The following is Wombat's inventory activity for September. So if you, if you're thinking about this, this is a pretty simplified example, but they have some open inventory. They've got 40 units, which were purchased at $12 per unit. Total cost, $480. Three days later, they purchased 60 units. Per unit cost of $13 a unit. Total of $780. Six days later, they make a sale of 65 units. We don't know how much they sold them for, and in this particular case, we don't particularly care. Under FIFO, the purchases happen 40 units to start with, then the additional 60 units get added onto the top. The sales, if you imagine this happening, start at the bottom and work their way up as you move through time. So the first 40 units sold come from the first 40 units that you have in hand, which is the $12 units. And whatever's left that needs to be sold, the remaining 25 units, these come from the $13 per unit units. Which means cost of goods sold, when you see that all calculated out, gives you a total of $805. The inventory at the end is all from those 60 units which were purchased last. And there's 35 of them left at $13 a unit, gives you $455 as closing inventory. Turning now to LIFO, just to see how it works. We start with 40 units. We purchase 60 units, so just as before. But when we sell those 65 units, we sell from the last units down. So we're assuming that of those 60 units, of those 65 units sold, 60 come from the $13 a unit units, and five come from the $12 a unit units meaning cost of goods sold is 840. Note it is different. What's left in inventory are those 35 units at $12 a unit for closing inventory of 420. And finally, weighted average, or moving average I should say, purchases, same deal, 40, and then we add the 60, but this is where it differs because we need to work out what the average units, average price per unit is, which is in this case $12.60. And it's almost like, and if I knew my color theory a little bit better, I'd try to find a color which sort of mixes those two. But what we end up with is just a pool of 100 units at $12.60. We don't care which unit gets taken, um, it's just one of the average of, of those 100 units. 
65 units, $12.60 gives you cost of goods sold of 819 and 35 units left at $12.60 gives you closing inventory of 441. Lastly, turning to property, plant and equipment, property, plant and equipment are tangible assets that are expected to be used in the normal course of operations for more than one year with no intention to resell. Now, obviously, they could get resold and we saw Woolworths had a number of items listed as assets held for sale, uh, but the, the intention is they're not to be resold. Uh, they're also tangible assets. If they're not tangible assets, they are intangible assets. Now. For the most part, the accounting is very, very similar. Um, we're not going to go into it here, but the actual way in which it gets done is quite similar. So following the cost principle, uh, PPE is recorded at its acquisition cost, uh, very similar to inventory, and we've already discussed that. So debit, PPE, credit, cash, or payables. Now, the thing is that if we have that entry, debit, PPE, credit, cash, we have no profit and loss effect. But the thing is, that asset is getting used up and it helps us support whatever the business is uh, that we have. And we need to have some level of expense linked to it that we can see so we're matching off the usage of the asset with the revenues generated from it. And this is what depreciation is. So the purpose of depreciation is to allocate the cost of PPE over its useful life. And this is very much an application of the matching principle. Depreciation in an accounting sense is nothing to do with market value. So when you hear about market, when you hear about depreciation in most instances out in sort of the quote unquote real world, um, you're talking about changes in value. When you're talking about accounting depreciation, you're talking about the allocation of cost. And the entry we've seen before is debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. The expense is that matching, so the depreciation expense will match off against the revenues earned in that particular period. And the accumulated depreciation is a contra account, which we'll soon see. And it is a contra asset account and it nets off against property, plant and equipment as a credit normal balance. And by making this entry, as we've just discussed, you're matching off the revenues and expenses, and you're also presenting the PPE at its carrying value, so net book value. Um, and that's because for pretty much every asset, with the exception of land, um, as land does not depreciate, um, pretty much every asset once it starts being used is definitely not worth its original cost. Um, so if we were to keep carrying this property plan equipment at cost, that would definitely be overstating matters. So the idea with depreciation is, is whilst it is not a market value effect, it is making sure there is some level of reduction to um, its original cost. Calculating this number though is not, you know, in some cases it's straightforward, but it, it's, it's sometimes not. Um, what we do is we have got to, act, we've got to calculate the depreciation expense each period. And to do so requires four pieces of information or well, three pieces of information and a choice around the method. So cost, useful life, residual value, and depreciation method. The cost we've just recorded, and it's generally fairly objective in nature. The useful life refers to the length of time the asset is expected to be used in operations. Residual value refers to the expected net realizable value of the asset at the end of its useful life. And the method refers to the systematic method chosen by the entity. Useful life and residual value are both estimates by the company. No one knows exactly how long an asset's useful life is. So um, these are very much estimates about, you know, how long the entity thinks it's going to be going to be useful for. Um, if they use similar assets, they'll have a better idea. If they haven't, well, it's, you know, it's a judgment call. Um, 
residual value as well. This is very much an estimate because it's looking at what you think it's worth at the end of that useful life. Um, again, if they've got experience, they should be able to make better job, better decisions with that. The depreciation method, um, we'll see in a second, there are a number of different methods that can be used, but the three that we see commonly, um, and certainly straight line is probably one of the easiest to work with, is a straight line method where you simply allocate an equal amount of the depreciable amount over the useful life. The reducing balance where you depreciate more early and a smaller amount later. And the units of activity measure where you're not actually looking at time, but you're actually measuring um, life based on how much total activity that particular um, asset could do. So if it's a car, how many kilometers it could drive. If it's um, you know a photocopy, how many photocopies it can make. If it's an espresso machine, how many coffees could it make, and so on. When we talk, when we talk about depreciation methods, we are talking about depreciation methods for accounting. Um, there are depreciation methods for tax, and they are very much a different thing. They often use schedules, and the purpose is different. How they calculate it is different. Um, we're not going to go into that here, but it's more just to be aware that they are different methods. So the the example we'll use here is a truck is purchased on the first of July, twenty sixteen. It costs sixty five thousand dollars. Estimated use for life is five kilometers or a hundred thousand five years. Five kilometers, five years or a hundred thousand kilometers, and the estimated residual value is fifteen thousand dollars. So for straight line depreciation, we simply find the depreciable amount, which is cost minus residual, gives you fifty thousand dollars, and divide that by the number of years, which in this case is five for ten thousand dollars per year. So the end of the end of each period, um, the calculation is fairly straightforward: fifty thousand divided by five. Depreciation expense is ten thousand dollars per year. Accumulated depreciation starts at ten and just builds. So we're adding for accumulated depreciation. We add the depreciation expense to what already existed. So there was nothing originally. So ten thousand. Another ten, twenty. Another ten, thirty, ten, forty, ten, fifty. So that builds or accumulates. The carrying amount is the cost less the accumulated depreciation. So 65 less 10 is 55, 65 less 20 is 45 and so on. For the reducing balance method, um, look, there is a formula for this, it's one I can never remember and it's, you know, for our purposes we can get away with the 1.5 times or the two times the straight line rate. And the straight line rate is one divided by the number of years. So in this example, and I'll talk about the, that reconciliation in a moment. This example, we're using double the straight line rate. And you'll notice in each year, it's one divided by five, which is the straight line rate in five years. And we're using double. So one, one divided by five times two, all the way through. When we do the calculation, we use the cost. So, uh, sorry. Well, I suppose it should be the carrying value, which at the very start is sixty-five thousand. Um, sixty-five thousand times one on five times two, so that's forty percent, gives you twenty-six thousand dollars. Accumulated is twenty-six. Carrying amount is thirty-nine. This thirty-nine, we take down to become the base for. The 40%, so 39,000 times 40% gives you 15,600, gives you 41,600, gives you 23,400 carrying. You take that down, do the same. Except, if you were to calculate this out properly, you're going to get a number which is bigger than 8,400, which means you end up with accumulated depreciation greater than 50,000. But because the residual value is 15,000, you can't have accumulated depreciation greater than 50. Um, so we actually, the final period is a reconciliation to the residual value. Um, that's what we've done here. And then we end up with zero. So we end up with no depreciation expense in the final two years. You can see it's much bigger early on and ends up at zero.
And the final method, the units of activity method, um, the depreciable the depreciation expense is allocated based on the number of units of activity as a proportion of the estimated lifetime units of activity. So in this case, that's 100,000 kilometers, which means there is 50 cents applied to each kilometer. Now, these kilometer figures here, the 24,000, 22, 27, 17, 10, these are just an assumption. Well, they're not an assumption, sorry. These are the kilometers which have been driven and we know this after the fact. So 24,000 kilometers times 50 cents gives you $12,000. 12,000 accumulated, 53 carrying. 22,000 times 50 cents gives you 11,000. 11 plus 12 gives you 23. 65 minus 23 gives you 42. And you just keep working that through all the way. And we end up with 15,000. When we compare all these methods, what we see is that the total amount of depreciation is the same. We end up with $50,000 of depreciation expense, either method. The only thing which differs is the timing. Straight line, it's even. Reducing balance is much more early on than reduces away. And units of activity bounces up and down a little bit, but you still end up with 50. There isn't a right or wrong method. Um, the method that a company should choose should really best fit the way the asset is used. If they believe the asset is being used up evenly over time, then they use straight line. If it's being used up more at the start and less at the end, reducing balance. If they can really tie the usage of the asset and the life of the asset to the amount of output of the asset, then units of activity. And finally, we want to get rid of something. Um, so when an asset is to be disposed of, the following needs to happen. Um, any depreciation expense that needs to get adjusted uh, to, to update the accumulated depreciation, that needs to be done. And that may be for partial years or partial periods, I should say. Uh, we then have to calculate any gain or loss on the disposal by comparing the carrying amount with any consideration on disposal. And also note that a disposal you could, disposal means getting rid of the asset. Now this could just be throwing it out um, or you know, junking it, or it could be that you're selling it and you're getting some sort of consideration. So consideration could be zero or some sort of non-zero amount. So then you need to prepare a journal entry and you need to reduce the asset account to zero. You need to reduce the accumulated depreciation of the asset in question to zero. You need to record any of the consideration to to be received or that you have received and to record the gain or loss. So in this case, at the end of five years, um, they sell the truck for $12,000 cash. At that particular time, the cost of the truck was $65,000. So that would be in the account at 65,000. The accumulated depreciation would be 50,000. No updating needed here. And that means the carrying value is $15,000. Now it was sold for 12, so you can already see that they've made a loss on this. We debit cash 12 to reflect the increase in cash. We debit accumulated depreciation 50 to, re to reduce the accumulated depreciation. I'll skip to the last bit. We credit property, plant and equipment, the truck, 65 to get rid of the truck. And if you ignore the loss on sale for a second, You've got 62,000 on the debit side and 65,000 on the credit side, which means you need 3,000 on the debit side and that is a loss on sale. Um, and that is disposing of an asset. And on that note, that wraps up topic four.